Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the Team House, episode 204. I'm David Park, co-host Jack Murphy, and tonight with us is Roger Luckshire. Uh, Mac V. Sog, Huey Crew Chief and Door Gunner wrote the great book, We Saved Sog Souls. Um, and I just, I want to get this right, Roger. You are two-time recipient of the Distinguished Flying Cross. Correct. It's fantastic. And um, I just want to remind everyone at the top, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. And uh, if you want to get these episodes ad-free, there's a link to our Patreon down in the description. So back to Roger. So, Roger, um, tell us, what is what is your origin story? How did you get the superpowers of being a crew chief and door gunner? Um, how did you grow up? And did you come from a military family? I do not. Um, there, I've had uncles um, that were in the military during World War II and an uncle that was in uh, the 82nd Airborne during the uh, 1950s, during peacetime. But um, uh, no, I didn't come from a military family other than I did have a brother that served in the National Guard and whatnot, uh, older brother. But um, I, I be became interested and getting into the military um, early on when uh, kind of when Kennedy took office and then um, when he was assassinated, that kind of resonated. Uh, the Vietnam War was kicking in in full swing and um, I wanted to serve and I um, went into the army uh, with the intention of going into special forces. So my recruiter said the only way to go that way is to join Airborne Unassigned, which was uh, pretty clever on his part. Sure. So, so in, you know, in my naivety, I, uh, I said, yeah, let's do it. And uh, so I went in. And uh, when I got through basic training, uh, I'm expecting to get my orders to go to jump school and then on my way to SF qualification. However, that di it didn't happen that way. Uh, I got my orders for um, AIT down at Fort Rucker, Alabama. And uh, I asked our assistant uh, platoon leader what this is all about. You know, I thought I was going to jump school. And he said, no, you have to do this first. And, you know, you get MOS in your background and then you, you move on from there. So I did, went down to Fort Rucker, um, did very well. Uh, I maxed out all the schools that were available for me. I you know, was fortunate enough to be uh, at the top of my class through each of the four classes that I uh, attended, the four different schools. And then finally went to jump school. Uh, after jump, when at the end of jump school, right the last few days, I met with the uh, SF recruiter, and believe it or not, he advised me to hold off. He said um, there is such a shortage in the infantry ranks right now. If for any reason, and I don't, I don't think there would be, but if for any reason uh, you had a problem. Through going through SF qualification, he said they're going to totally di ignore your current MOS and send you right to a straight to a line outfit. And he said, "What I what I recommend you do is, um, I've seen your orders. You're going to the 101st Airborne um, Aviation Unit." And he said, "Get some months under your belt. Get some experience under your belt, uh, so that when you do go for qualification." If you run into a problem going through uh, SF, they'll send you back to your unit because mm -hmm. you're already established and whatnot. So I thought that made sense. Um, sounded okay. Wasn't what I was planning, but you know, it's I think I'll give it a try. So I did and, and went to 101st um, and absolutely 
loved being with the 101st. It was an, an outstanding um, organization at that time. Um, the opportunities for learning new things, which um, I was kind of a sponge at the time and I couldn't get enough. So um, I did very well there. And um, we started out with the uh, the little whirly birds, the OH-13s and the OH-23s um, that look like a uh, look sort of like a uh, dragonfly, these small observation helicopters. Then in uh, the spring of 1967, um, we got our Hueys. We got our sea models. Sea model, sea models are gunships, so it was obvious uh, we we're going to be setting up with gunships. And I really liked the Hueys and uh, went to school for, I think it was four weeks uh, training on the Hueys, went to weapons school for training on the mini guns and, um, and, and the uh, rockets, the rocket pods, the 2.7 rocket, 7.5 rockets. And uh, I was really having a good time. And uh, in the meantime, during all of this, Another opportunity arose. Um, my first sergeant called me into his office and he said, me and my buddy of mine, he said, I've got an opportunity for you. He said, I think you might be interested in. And he said, um, There's a, uh, they're looking for people to qualify to go to a deep diving school that they're setting up. They're setting up a, a group of army hard hat divers. And he said, I think, I think you would like that, you know? So yeah. Okay. Well, why do we go? And uh, so then he, he said to me and my friend, he said, there's one catch. He said, if you fail to qualify, don't come back. Wow. He said, I don't care where you go. I don't care where you go. You don't come back to, to my company. Uh, we don't have losers. We won't have losers in this company. <laughs> now, so, I, you know, I, ju so I, I just want to uh, clarify real quick before we move on. When you went to Fort Rucker, you went there to be a, a it's a crew member, right? For uh, like a helicopter yeah. crew member. Well, it started off the first class at Fort Rucker was ba basic aircraft maintenance. OK, so it was fixed wing, you know. And then it progressed uh, into, by the time I did the, uh, the last training class, um, I was trained on uh, CH-34s, uh, the Sikorsky CH-34s, which I would later uh, come in contact with, with uh, SOG operating out of, uh, of FOB-1. But uh, I didn't get Huey training until, until I got to Fort Campbell, until we got those ships. So, yeah, so uh, it, going back to just going back a bit to uh, to that training, um, I said, sure, you know, I, I'll go for it. I said, but you're going to have to give give us time, time to train. You know, we don't know what the training is going to involve, but it's going to be endurance for sure. And it was going to be tested on base at Fort Campbell. And we had about a month to prepare. So he said, Take whatever time you want. Um, said, you know, I'll assign a jeep for you guys just to use to go over to Kentucky Lakes and train your ass off. Um, so I, I thought it was pretty good, pretty good opportunity. He said that the way it looks is this is going to be a very, very exclusive unit, and they're going to be stationed out of uh, out of California. Um, part of your training is going to come go through Bud's training, but it's not a training to knock you out. It's a training. He said, once you're accepted into the program, you're in. Uh, if you pass the testing and you're accepted, you're in. You're, they're not going to try. You know, there's, it's not training to break you. It's training to to, to teach. And uh, so, so we finished there, and he said, uh, he said, okay, the CO wants to see you too now. So we went in and uh, met our CO. He said the exact same thing that our first sergeant said. He said, you know, you're sure you want to do this? And we said, well, yeah. He said, okay, well, I wish you luck and I think you'll do well. He said, but if you fail, disappear. You don't come back here. <laughs> so, so anyway, make a long story short, we trained and trained and trained. 
we took the test um, and we were well prepared for the test. It was endurance tests and endurance uh, distance swimming. There was endurance underwater, underwater holding your breath and, you know, treading water and that sort of thing. Nothing spectacular, but uh, most of the guys that showed up for the uh, testing, most of them failed. And um, so we passed without, without any issues whatsoever. And uh, by that time, it was around the end of July. Um, early August, orders came down through the division. All orders are canceled. Um, the unit is going to Vietnam in mass. So um, that took care of my deep diving experience. <laughs> So, yeah, then then um, I, I was selected as uh, part of the advance party to take um, two of our gunships along with all their weapon systems, uh, plus one Jeep uh, loaded into a C-133, uh, which most people have never heard of, but they're, uh, they're like a C-130 on steroids. They're no longer in service. They were replaced by the 5As and the 17s and stuff. But at the time, at the time, they were massive. They were big, big turboprop aircraft. So we loaded our aircraft on that, uh, our two gunships, weapons, uh, my uh, my buddy, another crew chief, and one lieutenant. Uh, we loaded on that aircraft, and we made our long six-day journey over to uh, Vietnam. Now, this was, um, uh, how long had you been at the unit at this point in time? I had it was just um, just under a year. I was uh, I I went to um, Fort Campbell to the 101st, first uh, January first sixty seven, and I left there December third or so, uh, first or second or third, uh, and headed over to Vietnam. Now is this the um, is this the secret trip? Yes. That, okay. <laughs> Can you tell us like how you were if there was briefing about that and how that well, all went was. down. <laughs> yeah, there was, we were going over as, like I said, as an advanced party, we were going ahead of, ahead of our battalion. Um, <laughs> so yes, we had briefing and we had to, at that time, we, there was no such thing as subdued um, insignias and stuff. So we, we had to take a black magic marker and black out, black out our, our uh, insignias and our name, our name tag, and the U.S. Army and stuff, with a black uh, magic marker, and we were told, "You do not interact with anybody along the way. This is a highly classified movement, and uh, so that's the way it's going to be." And you understand that? And, well, yeah, okay. So we leave Fort Campbell, um, and we end up. Our first stop was Travis Air Force Base in California, and it was dark. We get off the airplane, and here's this massive, I mean massive banner, 30 feet long or whatever. Welcome 101st Air Force. <laughs> so we thought so much, so much for the security. Right. And and uh, so that kind of that kind of set the tone and uh, we had a good time there they treated us great we were only there overnight but um but the, the guys at the air force base there they treated us great and then uh, we moved on our next stop was hawaii and so on so you get your uh, two birds right and your jeep and you get to vietnam and yep. and did you guys know what you were going to be doing at that point in time? Well, I didn't know that I would be involved, end up being involved with SOG. But I did know, obviously, you know, we were a gunship going into combat. Right. We were, you know, a gunship crew going into combat. We knew, you know, we had we had practiced and whatnot at, uh, at Fort Campbell on the firing ranges and all that sort of thing. And. You know, yeah, we knew we're. And what what uh, what year was this? Nineteen sixty-seven. Okay, so yeah, we're still pretty early in the war. It's it's early in a war, yeah, and uh, like I say, it, being a gunship, 
uh, the only only reason for the existence of a uh, Huey gunship is for a gunfight. So we knew we knew what we were going into, and and quite frankly, we were pretty excited and pretty pretty pumped about being able to put our skills to uh, to work and and to help to help people out. I mean, the, the only time we would get scrambled or the only time we're going to fly is because somebody's in trouble and we need to shoot it out um, or, you know, run a convoy. But it turned out that there, there weren't that many convoys that we ran and there was a whole lot of firefights that we ran. So, so yes, I knew what we were getting into as far as that goes. So what, what was that like for you when your, your first combat mission out, because they had, they had substantial anti-aircraft. The NVA did. Yes. Well, I didn't run into that until later, until okay. uh, until we ended up at Camp Eagle at Wei Fubai. And when we started running uh, operations with SOG, <laughs> that's when uh, okay. that's when that happened. But before then, our our missions were uh, primarily, you know, in in uh, Vietnam within the borders. While we were down south in Benoit, our first our first uh, base camp was in Benoit, uh, which is only 30 miles north of Saigon, a little northwest. And we were running missions for the supporting the 101st Airborne uh, ground troops and, and some of the other units. And we started running a few missions with uh, for special forces up in uh, on the border areas. Uh, we ventured into Cambodia a few times. To run some uh, some ops, and um, I, that's where we made our connection, let's say, with uh, with special forces, and um, so we ran a lot of operations down there. Uh, first time I got shot down was was down in was down south. Um, it was right after the Tet Offensive, and uh, then the, the beginning of March of '68 we moved uh, north to Camp Eagle and started our intense relationship with CCN, mm -hmm. primarily FOB1 and Kason until Kason closed. And then uh, Mylock, when Mylock opened up Mylock Camp, a launch site, uh, which was up in the Quang Tree area. Now, when you first got into country, you had like the best personnel. Your door gunner was squared away, right? Yes. Well, when we when we first got in country, there was an influx of new personnel. We had some um, infused because the entire division went to Vietnam in December of 67. Our DROS was going to be all the same, basically the same time a year later. So naturally, uh, we had to, the division had to work that out. And we uh, had an infusion of people into our unit and at the same time we you know there were people removed from our unit um and yes uh my first partner actually my my first real partner my second door gunner um the first one that i had um didn't work out i just i just didn't feel quite comfortable with him um, he was a good kid, um, a very, a very good kid. He ended up flying with, um, the CNC aircraft for one of the general's aircraft, the assistant commanding general. But unfortunately this, this, uh, spec five, he lost his life a couple months later, um, hopping over, um, uh, our helicopter revetment and getting clipped by, uh, by a rotor blade oh. and, uh, killed him instantly. But so he was technically my first door gunner, but that was only a very short okay. period, no more than a couple of weeks, maybe. Um, but then, yeah, then I got my partner in uh, a guy by the name of Steve Harper. He was a uh, he was already a combat infantry vet from 1st Brigade, 101st Airborne. Um, he was a machine gunner, M60 machine gunner as a ground troop. Uh, he knew the weapons like the back of his hand and uh he he was my partner we were uh closer than close to say 
to say the least. Well, I was actually talking about Private Loser. Okay, Private Loser. Yeah. Yes. He was. He was never. He was never an assigned door gunner. Okay. Um, he was one of the ones infused into the unit, and it was it was very obvious, very quickly, that his prior unit saw an opportunity to get rid of this dirt bag and uh, apparently told him about flight pay and combat pay and all this kind of stuff. And he jumped on it. But this guy, this guy was, he was, he was unfit to be in the military. Nonetheless, none <laughs> than to be in an airborne unit. I mean, that was just disgusting. Yeah. yeah private loser. Yeah. You, you talk about your first flight out with him when you guys start receiving fire and I guess he's got the M60 sitting in his lap. He's like yeah. buckled in. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, we handheld, we handheld our M60s. We didn't use them mounted. Uh, we didn't use bungee cords. I mean, we just, we held them. And, and I felt, uh, and I was the uh, unofficial line chief uh, from early on. And I just felt we had more mobility just free free holding those freestyle and anyway yeah we i had to take him out uh on a mission and um we ended up in a firefight and i'm out out in a skid firing away and i can see nothing's happening you know i can there's no trace coming from the other side other than the miniguns and um after we made our first gun run i uh I turned on the, the intercom. I said, "What's wrong?" And and he said, "There's something wrong with the with the M60." And I, you know, I, I didn't believe him to begin with. I didn't want him in my aircraft to begin with. So I said, "Give it to me. We'll switch." So I, I took it and I I told the pilot, "Listen, I'm I'm going to fire off a few rounds." And you know, I fired off. There was nothing wrong with the with the weapon. And uh, so when we got back on the ground, I said, what the hell's, you know, what the hell's going on? And he said, I don't know. It's the gun. It was, it was, the, it was the, the machine gun. It didn't work. It wasn't working. Don't blame me and all this and that. So I told him to clean. All right. Clean the weapons uh, while I take care of the aircraft. Well, I, he didn't, he didn't, wouldn't tear it down. He didn't tear it down. And his excuse to me was that, well, they're not, they're really not dirty. <laughs> So I said, I don't give a shit if they're dirty or not. I want you to strip them down. And this is what we do. Um, and he said, and he just ended up refusing. So I started filing complaints with our first sergeant and uh, told him how he's got to do something about this guy because he doesn't belong with us. He's no good. He's useless. Um, and he's going to get somebody killed. I mean, when you're in a gunship, and you're in a firefight, if somebody doesn't, if one person doesn't pull their weight, you are in deep trouble uh, because you're, you're vulnerable. I mean, you're, that, those helicopters are extremely, extremely vulnerable. It doesn't take a lot to, uh, to penetrate the skin. I mean, you can put, you can put a pellet gun through the side of one of those. Um, so anyway, one thing led to another and I get into it in, in the book, uh, but we ended up, we ended up getting rid of them. Yeah, sort of uh, with with a bit of prejudice because your partner or like your buddy, yeah, he pulled the private loser yes. pulled the gun on him, right? Yeah, my my partner there, Steve, uh, he was he was a professional soldier. He was a no nonsense, um, maybe hardcore, you know, but he he was excellent. And he, he, when we were off, we had downtime. He liked his Jack Daniels. And, um, Who doesn't? Yeah, exa yeah exactly. Yeah. So he, he came back into our hooch one night, a little bit a little bit tipsy, and he banged into this loser's bunk, who his bunk was almost directly across from mine, like a little diagonal from mine. And a verbal fight ensued and uh steve was ready he was ready to pop this guy and 
this loser came up with one of these pearled handle nose guns and stuck it right in his in Steve's face and said, I will I will shoot you, MF and whatnot. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Yeah, and so so Steve, Steve never wanted to back down. He's, he he leans into him and he said, "Do it, do it, do it." And, he, and so I got a hold of Steve. Some other crew members got a hold of this loser, and we quieted things down. And uh, so that night, I, and I like I said, I knew my partner, knew him well, even though. We probably only been together a couple of weeks. Um, I knew him very well, and I I believed in my heart that he wasn't going to let go of this tonight, that night. So I switched bunks. Steve's bunk was a few bunks down from mine, near the other end of the hooch. I switched with the guy that was going to sleep next to him, and he said, "He said, what the hell are you doing?" I said, "I'm going to babysit." I said because you're, I know what you're going to do if I if I don't watch you, <laughs> and uh, so this this really bothered Steve. Uh, it was working on him over the next few days, really, really, really bad, and he he just kept saying, "I'm going to kill that son of a bitch." He said, "I I am not going to let him get away with this," and uh, I said, "Steve, you know, you got to calm down." I said. You, you know, anything happens to him right now with you, um, you're, you're going to jail, man. You know, uh, let it go. And he said, I can't. I just can't let it go. So I decided that um, on a way of handling it. And this character had a bad habit of not buckling up. When he got in, he didn't do anything right. And and one of the things he didn't do right was he didn't buckle up. He didn't put his, his monkey strap on. And every crew chief that he flew with had to tell him, buckle up, buckle up. Of course, he didn't have to buckle up because he wasn't going to get into any any combat situation. I guess that was what it was in his mind. He wasn't going to put himself at risk. But anyway, <clears throat> I decided that, um, and I'm I'm not proud of this part, but it is what it is, and it was what it was. So I decided that the next time he flew with me, I wasn't going to tell him to buckle up. And if he didn't buckle up, the first gun run we made, I was going to kick him right out. And... Uh, be what it was. So um, Harper wasn't too happy with that uh, initially. And I said, Steve, no one's going to question this. We all know this guy has a bad habit of doing that. No one's going to know. If it happens something with you, then you know it's not going to fly. Mm. So re reluctantly, he said, OK, well, the day came. He's gonna he's gonna fly with me, so we're down on the flight line, and uh, <laughs> I look down the flight line, and here comes a jeep, full bore, down the flight line. It's top first sergeant. He and I were very close. He looked after me all the time. Um, I could talk to him about anything. He he was just a real straight shooter. <laughs> he he come down to the flight line. And Harper's in the Jeep with him, <laughs> my partner. And he gets out of the Jeep and he was livid. I mean, he was ripping mad. And he said, Chief, he said, I know what you're going to do. And it's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> and I said, you know, I played stupid, which pissed him off even more. <laughs> I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And... Um, he said, you know damn well what I'm talking about. He said, I'm not going to let you ruin your life for some piece of shit. And uh, so he took Private Loser, told Harper to, to take the flight. And I asked, I asked Steve, I said, what did he say to you on the way down? He said, nothing. 
He said he, he pulled up outside the hooch. He yelled at the top of his lungs for me to get my ass out there. <laughs> and he, he said, so I don't know. I don't know how we found out. And to this day, I don't know how we found out. But um, we did our we did our mission before we left. Um, he said, he, the, uh, our first sergeant said to me, he said, chief, when you get back from this mission, you come straight to see me. He said, we're going to have a talk. I said, okay. So we, when I came back, I checked out the aircraft like I always do, make sure it's mission ready, and went up to see him. And he he made me wait outside for, I don't know, five or ten minutes. I told the orderly, the clerk, um, you know, that he wanted to see me. He said, oh, yeah, he knows. He said, but I don't know what's going on. He said, but he is in a bad, bad mood. <laughs> He said, I don't know. He said, I don't know what's going on. He said, he's been making calls all over the division all morning. And uh, he said, he is just in a very bad mood. And um, <laughs> so finally he came out and he looked at me and he just said, follow me. So we went up to the mess hall and um, we sat down and he said, I don't want to hear a word out of you. He said, just listen to me and uh, I'll tell you when you can talk. So he, he went on to say, I, to tell me that he said, I told you I would take care of it. I told you to give me some time. He said, you didn't wait. You weren't going to wait for me and you were going to take things into your own hands. And I said, well, Todd, I did wait. I said, but I couldn't wait any longer. And, and he said, well, he said, I got him uh, transferred. He said, and you're staying here with me until he clears the area. <laughs> and, and he had Harper um, wait in the, um, in his, in his, in the uh, CO's tent until this character was uh, shipped out. And uh, he said, don't ever do something so stupid like that again. <laughs> So that was it. That's how we. That's how we got rid of them. But the, all the other people that were infused were really good. Were really good. We had some outstanding people come in to the unit. Old school NCO. I like it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Let me. Uh, I got to give a, a quick shout out to the sponsor for tonight's show. It's Sap Gear. Um, Sap Gear makes all sorts of like really interesting stuff. Uh, for our secret squirrels out there, um, even people who are not necessarily in the military or in the intelligence community, people who are in, uh, in non-governmental organizations, aid organizations, people who travel abroad, uh, all sorts of things to help you um, with escape and evasion. They make a lot of like uh, escape and evasion necklaces and bracelets that can help you escape restraints uh, in that sort of worst case scenario. But also a lot of things like uh, what that we'd call like signature reduction today. They have a lot of digital security items. Um, yeah, like we we love their stuff. Um, they, they have the Jedberg uh, little patches, which I really like, which are the RFID tags that you can you know transfer stuff to. Um, they make all types of, I mean, Faraday cage stuff for yeah. your electronic devices. They, yeah, they they sell a lot of the stuff. Uh, they they have uh, some of the things that I like are. Just like if you get into an Uber and plug in your phone, like you're generally plugging it into the Uber and they can steal your data. So they have little USBs that you can that you can plug in to keep, you know, to, to protect your data and things like that to put between your phone and, and another source. Um, check out their website, sapgear.com. They have a lot of great stuff. Um, yeah, you'll find something that you like, though, yeah. I promise. So go to sapgear.com and you use the promo code TEAMHOUSE and you'll get 20% off your order. So again, sapgear.com and use the promo code TEAMHOUSE to get 20% off your order. So, Roger, what, what was your typical mission profile? Did you guys only respond to troops in contact or would you fly support a lot of times for movements? What was your typical day like? Well... Typical day until I got involved with SOG was, um, you know, again, it could be supporting a medevac. It could be, um, it could be flying support for troop movement for a convoy, but also when a unit was in contact. 
that was uh, that was most of our activity was when someone was in contact. And in the early days, the first couple months that I was in country, um, I did a lot of flying out of the area of Sambe. And uh, we lived, we had cots that were just set up in the open air in the dirt. And uh, we slept under the stars while the mortars and rockets would, would be tossed in at us. But um, most of the time in that area, we were going to take care of firefights. We were going to, you know, people were in trouble. And it was a mix match of um, NVA, Viet Cong. Uh, Sambe region is real close to the Cambodian border. And the NVA were able to slip it in and out of Vietnam very easily in that region. Um, and it would raise havoc along the way. So that was that was kind of a typical day. A typical day could be anything. Could it could uh, have a wide range of things uh, because we were we were on call, and um, it could be night during the night as much as during the day. There was uh, it was twenty four seven. Once we moved north, things changed. Um, and they changed in a wild way. <laughs> we we got involved with CCN, and um, at that point, more of my missions were happening with SOG. And uh, you asked before what it was like the first time uh, we got shot at with anti-aircraft. It was it was one eye opener. Let me tell you. Um, it was the uh, the first time we ventured into Laos, and they're firing at us slow moving helicopters with these air bursting cannons. And to me, and I, and I describe it in my book that I mean it looked like a scene out of World War II with all this these air bursts going all around. And uh, <laughs> and I'm. I remember thinking to myself, what the hell is this? I didn't know. I didn't know we were going to run into this sort of thing. And um, and lots and lots of heavy machine gun, the, the 12 sevens and the 14 sevens and stuff. Um, just all kinds of all kinds of stuff that they would throw at us. So, it, yeah, that, and a typical day uh, running SOG was uh, not a typical day by any stretch. But it was uh, it was it was quite a uh, it was quite an experience and one that uh, one that we dedicate ourselves one hundred percent to. We had uh, early early on um, in May we had some issues with um, another gunship group that um, when we had to use a heavy fire team for SOG. Uh, which consisted of four gunships, two R2, and two from a uh, another unit altogether. Uh, it was a disaster. It was a it was a near disaster for for all of us. Um, the the other gunship team pulled away at the last minute when we were under heavy contact. The, the team on the ground was on the verge of being overrun. And we set up a gun run using the four gunships, which is a you know a large racetrack. Um, but when our wing ship broke behind, you know, we we made the first pass. Uh, just as we break, we start to break left, our wing ship starts their gun run, and that protects our you know, our pull away, because mm -hmm. when once we go belly up, the only thing we had to protect ourselves was the door gun, one door gun. Um, I mean, you're totally vulnerable. That's when you're most vulnerable. So when our wing ship started uh, making his gun run, before he finished his gun run, these two other gunships pulled away said they were running out of fuel. Now, they're the same aircraft as we had. 
um, our gunship and us nearly, I mean, we nearly got shot out of the sky. And the people on the ground were left with this big open gap of coverage, of air coverage. So we ended, we did, we regrouped real quickly. Um, we did get the team out successfully. When we got back to FOB1, uh, CCN, FOB1 and Fubai, we met with um, the commander of FOB1 at the time was Lieutenant Colonel Roy Barr. And we met with him and several other team leaders. And we told him that, now my fire team, we discussed this ahead of time before going into the meeting. We told, we told the Colonel that we really, really want to work with them and continue to work with them. Um, but we're not going to work with them unless it's exclusive 101st airborne gunships. If we need more gunships, more than the two, we get them from the 101st, nobody else. And we explained why. And he knew what happened out there because he's, he's monitoring the radios for the extraction. And we didn't know how he was going to respond. We're kind of new to the neighborhood. Um, and he said, and, and we told him, if, if you agree to what we're asking for, um, then we make a commitment that we will never, ever leave a team behind. And there had been several teams before this time that had been left behind and lost. Um, he said, that's fair. That's fair enough. Uh, you know, you got it. So from that point on, um, we were, we were committed and we stuck by that promise, um, right up until the time that, uh, I got shot down in Laos. Um, our gunship got shot down in Laos in the process of getting a team out of, of a near impossible situation. Now, we did get the team out successfully. Unfortunately, we got left behind on the ground in uh, Laos. <laughs> but um, a typical day in SOG is not, well, is not like any other typical day, none whatsoever. We were, uh, my fire team, we were going out on a daily basis either putting a team in or pulling a team out. Mm -hmm. And the way we viewed it was if we put a team in, that's our team. And when the time comes, it's our job to get them out. They finish their job. Now it's our job and we have one job to do. And that is to get them out for whatever it takes. And, um, and we lived by that and, and we survived by that too, by being, maybe overly aggressive at times. I mean, we, there were times that we would attack straight on, uh, their 12.7, uh, dual guns and, and go after them straight on and, um, pure aggression, uh, was winning the day every time, uh, because they were overwhelmingly superior numbers. I mean, we're, we're in their backyard where there, there could be hundreds and at times thousands. And uh, we just got a little small fire team group and group of uh, warriors on the ground. So before you moved, before you got involved with, with uh, CCN, when you were still flying for the 101st, you, you got, that was the first time you got shot down, correct? The first time I got shot down was uh, back in the Sambe area. Yeah, well, uh, supporting elements of the 17th Cav uh, and the 101st. Yeah, we got shot down. We got shot down over a so-called friendly village. Can Can you tell us what that experience was like getting shot down? Like what What were you guys doing at the time, and what led to those events? And then what was okay. it like for you? This was uh, during the aftermath of Tet. I mean, you guys as warriors know that um, uh, battles like the Tet Offensive, that wasn't a one night or two day <laughs> deal. That, that lasted for several weeks. 
Um, and it was overwhelmingly a success for the uh, Allied troops and particularly the U.S. But anyway, um, it was during the aftermath of Tet. We were operating in Sambe, uh, like I say, supporting elements of the uh, 101st Airborne and the 17th Cav um, and some various Arvin units. And the NBA um, had taken over this village uh, just south and east of where we were at Sambe. And it was heavy, heavy fighting had broken out uh, between the NBA and, um, and the 101st um, ground troops. So we went, we, we got called, we went to the area, and we were told that uh, the village, as we approach the area, there was, uh, there was a road. And, um, at one end of this road, there was a village of, you know, six or eight, ten houses. Then there was a span of openness, op open road and, you know, jungle and whatnot. And then another village. Um, about the same size. We were told to be careful and not fire into the first village uh, that were, those were friendlies. Those were all friend, friendlies. So, excuse me. So when we got there, we caught a platoon or more of NBA running down this road in mass. So we set up on them and uh, we made a gun run on them. And as we're passing over this friendly village, like ants coming out that got stirred up, here's the NBA in full regalia, full uniform, just like the ones that were running down the road. They come out with their AKs at full blast at us. Now we're only you know, we're only a few hundred feet above them and we're totally vulnerable. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're not firing. And we took we took a lot of hits. We took a lot of hits. But there was still a mission at hand. I mean, we still had these NBA to, to contend with. And we took down a lot of them on our first gun run. And we circled around, make a second run, gun run, this time... <laughs> This time we're not going to spare the uh, the village, and um, <clears throat> we're we're picking up a lot of vibr vibrations in the aircraft. I mean, I could feel it. With when you have a main rotor that gets damaged, you can feel the the vibration like in your body core. You can feel it, and if it's a tail rotor, a high frequency vibration, you feel it in your feet. It's like getting tingling in your feet. And I could feel both. I could feel both going on. I could smell fuel, which uh, it's never a good thing. So we made we made our second gun run. We lit up that village. I mean, we really we poured rockets and mini guns and door guns into it. Uh, we got the remainder of the uh, NVA that were uh, still semi in the open. Some were diving for cover, and we got the second them and the second village as well. But we were starting to, it felt like we were going to shake ourselves apart. And uh, alarms are going off in, in the helicopter. We took more hits on the second pass. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. You say what's going through your mind. Um, when you're in a firefight, there's, um, I mean, you've got the, the adrenaline's pumping. You're so hyper-focused on what you're doing. Um, I don't know, uh, it, you just deal with it. You just deal with it. I, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say there was fear involved. The fear would set in later when, when the ad adrenaline seeps back into your body and you start to feel the fatigue. And that's when the reality of what took, to, uh, what just took place. That's when that, that kind of sets in and you feel it. Um, we did make it back to our little, <clears throat> our little airstrip, our dirt airstrip. Uh, made a hard landing, but um, but nobody got injured. Our helicopter, I had counted thirty-eight holes in the helicopter. 
Um, the main rotors were shot. The main rotors were shot up. The tail rotor was shot up. There were there were holes in a lot of places. Fuel leaking out. So your but, post your post flight check, you're like, yeah, this one's not good to go yeah, back no, up. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think we can fly this one. <clears throat> so hey, this one's not going to fly. So um, yeah, that was the first time we got shot shot down. And um, I will say that um, the battle was continuing to uh, to rage uh, over in that area, and um, I could hear our uh, our quad. Um, 50s firing and you know that's a bad situation when you've got those things just going non-stop and now uh, they're starting to ferry the wounded wounded uh, americans and they're coming in on medevacs and uh, the fellow who was piloting my aircraft at the time um, he was an ex sf guy he was a medic and the uh, SF medic for 12 years, then went to flight school, became a pilot. Um, his medical in instincts kicked in and we were triaging the uh, wounded as they were uh, being brought in. And uh, there were a lot, of, a lot of dead, a lot of uh, obviously dead. And uh, others that were, you know, termed KIA, but weren't covered up. So we would be moving. We started, um, Harper and I, and this fellow Whitaker, Mr. Whitaker, we were moving moving the uh, wounded and the bodies around. One of the, one of the soldiers that was uh, bodies was predetermined KIA. Um, we were, Harper and I were, carrying him on a on a stretcher over to where we were, we were putting the KIA. And Mr. Whitaker, he, he looked over and he said, wait, 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 wait. So we stopped and we put him down and he started, he started you know, checking him out. He started giving him um, CPR uh, pumps. And um, he said, leave this one here. He says, I got this one. I don't think he's dead. And um, he stuck with it. He stuck with this guy. Um, we were loading up the wounded onto uh, Chinooks on the CH-47s. We loaded this fella on along with uh, Mr. Whitaker, who was who didn't leave his side. He stuck with him. Um, I don't know what he saw in in, him, in this in this guy because he was dead. You know. Um, he he left went to the field hospital with with them and then uh, you know a couple hours later or a few hours later he returned and we asked him how do you how do you make out and he said they were able to stabilize the wow. guy they got him stabilized and i asked him i said what made you what made you you know zero in on him and he said i don't know i honestly don't know he said just something just something told me um to help him. And I think that's where I think his SF training mm -hmm. and all his experience just kicked in. Um, and here the guy's walking around maybe today, but certainly, you know, at, during that time after he recovered, not knowing how dead he was and how this man unknown to him saved his life. Um, Unreal. He should, yeah. I mean, if anybody deserved a, uh, like a soldier's medal or something. It, it it was him that day because he just he just was relentless. He would not let this guy go. And yet, I mean, there were so many others that you know that that were dead. Um, so that was um, the by the end of the day, by the time the the fighting stopped, I had kind of like I don't say like a, uh, not blackout portion, but everything kind of blurred together um for a few hours there but when it quieted down i sat down on the ground with my partner and i looked at him and i said jesus steve you're covered in blood and he said oh really look at yourself and and i looked down and i mean just mud and dirt and blood just covered both of us were just covered 
Um, so that was uh, that was a hell of an experience for getting shot down. We didn't get hurt though. No, that's amazing. When what was your logistics like when you had a bird that that was that shot up? Did you yeah. have to swap it out? Did you guys have enough in in country to to get it back up to speed quickly? Well, yes. Um, that that helicopter had to be hooked back to uh, base camp to Benoit. Uh, a Chinook lifted it, uh, slinged it, and brought it back. And it was out of uh, commission for a couple of weeks, and um, and that was it. We only had. At that time, we only had six gunships for our uh, aviation battalion. We had six gunships. There were two command and control, command and control aircraft um, that the, the general and assistant uh, commanding general flew on. Um, and that was it. I think there were a couple of loaches, but um, we just had six gunships. So what precipitated your move, uh, your move to like CCN? What, was the entire element moving up there or were you being yes. tapped? Okay. So yes, the entire element, the entire division moved from Benoit uh, in the south, in the southern area. The entire division moved up to I-Corps um, at what is called Wei Fu Bai. Camp Eagle was located halfway between the city the city the city of Wei and the city of Fubai. Uh, and that was Camp Eagle. That was our new base camp. And uh just outside our base camp, a very short distance, was FOB one. And um so we uh continued to you know to work with them and then more and more uh working with them. And I ended up basically I was flying with FOB one or caisson uh, during the day and then flying uh, missions, firefly missions or patrols, uh, search and destroy missions at night with the 101st and then back to FOB one or caisson in the morning and do it all over again. And, and how how did you guys first, like get in, did you know about Mac V SOG at the time and how, did, how was your introduction to them? Well, our first, our first introduction was when we were down at um, Sound Bay. There was a, a launch site or an, an outpost on the top of Sound Bay Mountain. It was a um, ASA um, relay station, but there was also a, a, um, a small group of SF up there. And we didn't know they were SOG at the time. We didn't, we didn't know what was going on, but we knew that, um, you know, when we were asked um, to go across the fence, to go over into Cambodia with them, that um, at that time, they just said, you know, you, you guys don't have to be involved with this. Um, these are kind of classified operations. And if you don't want to be involved, that's, that's fine. But, you know, we weren't going to turn anything down. Uh, but when we got up north, then it became very formal. Then it was formal. Then it was the non-disclosures, the 20-year um, non-disclosures, um, the explaining to us that uh, if we were to get shot down and captured in Laos or North Vietnam, that if we didn't get pulled out immediately, we were on our own, mm -hmm. uh, that, that the U.S. is likely to deny that we're part of any any kind of authorized um, military action or anything like that. That, But again, I mean, you know, we were young. I was 22 at the time and as the rest of us. And it's like, yeah, OK, well, we had to when we went on missions, we had to leave our dog tags at the talk. Um, at FOB1 or if it was Kason or Mylock, our wallets, you know, um, so there was no real identification on us. Uh, we were also told that if we were captured, we were going to be treated as spies. And, um, you know, it's not going to be good mm. that, that you probably aren't going to, you know, survive. You'll probably be tortured and uh, before you're killed. 
But again, it's like, yeah, okay, well, where do we sign? <laughs> so, but you know, um, you know, to put things in, into perspective, um, by this time, we felt that um, we we truly felt that we were very good at what we did, mm. and we worked as a team. Our gunship um, was a team. We didn't we didn't switch out. We switched out co-pilots, not pilot or crew chief and door gunner. We didn't switch out. We stayed as a team. And as such, we're very, very effective. When we were in the midst of a firefight, nobody had to say anything um, other than the pilot say, we're going to make our gun run and break left, or we're going to break right, or we're going to go straight. And, and he would not vary from that, regardless of what was happening on the ground and regardless of what we were taking, uh, because he knew that if he varied from that, I mean, I was going to be out on the skids. My partner would be out on the, the skids on the other side. If he varied from that pattern, he's liable to throw us, you know, one of us out of the aircraft off mm -hmm. the skids. So, um, but there was, you know, we worked as a team. We were very, very effective. We fought very, very aggressively uh, as, as a team. And, um, you know, we felt that there was a need and that the guys that were going out on the teams, um, the recon teams, that they were going out to do a job. At least we, what we could do is bring them back when they finished their job. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the way we, that's the way we saw it. And that's, uh, that's how, that's how we developed the, the strong relationship. Was there, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're sort of serving two masters right now, right? You have the 101st and, you know, in, in any other conventional units. And then yes. you also have the MACV SOG. How, how like, how did that work in terms of scheduling you guys and who got priority of fires and things like that? Well, I'm not I'm not absolutely certain on how how that scheduling went. But I do know that once we started working with SOG, um, that was a priority. That was a priority. Now, of course, there are exceptions. And um, an exception, for example, um, in August, the beginning of August, August 4th, the 101st Airborne Division made a massive, massive assault into the Oshawa Valley. Um, and we were part of that. We had to be part of that operation. We, we, uh, um, we were supporting the uh, insertion of troops throughout the Oshawa so, I mean, it would be exceptions like that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, other than that, our priority was uh, in support of SOG. And especially if we had put a team out and there was a team out there um, that we were like responsible for, mm -hmm. then, um, I mean, that was the priority. That was a priority. And of course, if something, when Camp Eagle came under attack, which it did on different occasions, um, well, then, you know, our, our, uh, our support was there. But then again, that would be at night and we weren't running. So, I mean, we couldn't, we didn't have the capability of running across the border at night. Uh -huh. How many uh, uh, gunships did the division have at that point in time? Well, we started out with the aviation battalion having just the six, as I described it, um, in Early July, mid early to mid July, the 101st Airborne Division transitioned to the 101st Air Cavalry Division, and we there were several several gunship companies and slick companies, transport companies, um, and uh, reconnaissance aircraft all infused into the 101st, and at that time. Um, we had around 20 gunships uh, to the division. Now I don't know the exact numbers. Um, there were several there were several transitions that took place during the summer of '68 with the 101st. Um, but I was I, I was rarely um, at base camp. I mean I'd be at base camp overnight usually uh, if I wasn't spending the night at um, one of the SOG launch sites. 
Um, so I wasn't there during the day, uh, rarely. So all these things were happening and I was, I was oblivious to the transitions that were taking place. We moved my, my company unit, moved locations within Camp Eagle um, they, three times. Well, once, uh, twice after the first initial spot. Both those times, I didn't know we moved until I got, till we got back um, at night and uh, found that <laughs> my, my tent, the tent that I was with, my unit, our platoon was in a whole totally different area and all my stuff was moved over. So, you know, these things were happening and a lot of things happened that uh, command was changing because of the, the way the division um, was evolving. Uh, commanders were changing and, and whatnot. So, uh, you know, a lot of that I was totally unaware of and really didn't care. And so with, you know, the estimated 20 gunships, would all of them work with SOG or was no. that okay? No, no, those the the gunships that worked with SOG were our initial six gunships, mm -hmm. and that was it. But it would be two at a time, mm -hmm. normally two at a time. On rare occasion, when we would you uh, be working with a hatchet force, uh, for for SOG then we might use a heavy fire team using four uh four gunships um but um usually it was two and um after uh after the fourth of july when my gunship without me uh went down and uh was destroyed along with the uh the four men on board uh, then I was uh, assigned, I was given a new gunship, and it was a hog. Um, it was a uh, called the Aerial Artillery Platform. We had a 40 millimeter cannon in the nose and two 18 shot rocket pods, uh, one on each side. And um, we carried, we, when we got that, I boosted the ammo box for the 40 millimeter from 250 rounds to 500 rounds and um, continue, continue to keep our door guns. We carried 1800 rounds of door gun um, where, you know, normally in country, uh, a gunship might carry 750 rounds or so at a time. But we, when we were on, um, on an operation, it was, um, and it was a firefight breaking out. I mean, you, we had to, you know, give it all to get a team out and we couldn't, uh, we couldn't run out of ammo before we got a team out. That, that would have been disastrous. So, uh, we carried, uh, we carried that much door gun and many, many, many times we came back with that, those things empty. Uh, we carried extra barrels for the M60s cause we'd have to dump them occasionally as they would just get cherry red and, um, and you have to just dump them. So we would uh, carry spares on that. Now, was that still that uh, the aerial artillery platform, was that still a Huey or was it a brand new type? It was of a Huey. Yeah, okay. it was a Huey. It was a C model. Um, but it was because because of the weaponry, it was, you know, so-called termed uh, aerial artillery platform, uh, which it, it was it was a pretty potent a uh, pretty potent uh, armament uh, for for a helicopter that size. I mean, it was a lot of firepower, tremendous amount. And what, so what was that like for you now? So you've been firing, I mean, you've been flying these hot missions to the point where you got shot down. You've been flying, you know, for conventional military who are hooking and jabbing. And now you're inserting, you know, these small teams um, in, in, very hostile territory. How was that for you? What what was that like? Well, um, what was it like? It was. Um, I mean, it was it was pretty unnerving at, at times. I mean, and a lot of times unnerving for the team. Um, for you know, unnerving for me for what the team was going through. Um, more often than not, when we 
uh, extracted a team, it was under fire. Mm-hmm. And we're talking a team of three Americans and maybe four in Dij or five in Dij being assaulted by dozens or hundreds of hardcore NBA. Mm-hmm. So I think the stress for me and for us was that the fact that we couldn't fail. I mean, I mean, if you fail, if you fail, your friends' lives are, are at stake. You know, these guys, they have no other, there's no other option. There's no other option. Um, either, either we get them out or they never come out. I mean, it's it just as simple as that. There is no other thing. So um, I think, I think, I think we felt a lot of empathy towards the, the team members and that there were some times that I know I felt that, you know, it, can't we do more? I mean, why can't we, we do more? Are we doing enough? You know? Um, so it was, um, it was st- stressful in that way. Stressful that in the fact that um, you don't want to fail, you don't want to let them down, you know, cause it's not just a matter of, well, you know, we'll try again tomorrow. That that's right. not going to happen. Yeah, that's not going to happen. You're talking where seconds, seconds count, not hours, not minutes, but seconds can make the difference. And we could see from the air. I mean, we could see what was happening to the team. We could see the dozens and dozens of NBA trying to wipe them out. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know. There, there was, uh, it was, it was that, that sort of thing, and that's why, um, I think maybe it's it's why we were um, as successful as as we were. Is it's because, um, I don't know, you have you have you have a uh, a camaraderie or a brotherhood that, um, again, I keep going back to the the statement of, they went in there, and in the backyard. Uh, the enemy they did their job they've been down there for two two days three days four days five days whatever it might be now they've done their job they did what they set out to do now (laughs) all we have to do is get them out you know so um yeah that's look you know looking back and talking to um a lot of the people that I interact with over the past, you know, 10, 12 years from SOG. Um, and a lot of times they'll say, you know, why, why did you do it? Why you were doing it over and over. And um, I said, well, what other choice? What other choice do you have? You know, I mean, we're, we're, you were there to do a job. You did your job. At least we could do is do our job. So that was that was kind of the attitude. That was the feeling. You know, it's been uh, it's come out. I mean, I think Jack's even written about this. We've talked about it with other guests that Mac V. Sog was compromised in Saigon. Mm. That that basically every time those the the fact that 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 it was successful at all is a testament to how amazing the the people involved the men involved were because it was because the soup the the vietnamese knew the north vietnamese knew every time they were going to go in where their mission was like in retrospect like d- does it make sense d- does i mean you put in a six-man team or a seven-man team they should not automatically have a company's worth of north vietnamese on them Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That I, I talk about that a little bit in the in the book. Um, I'm in the process of a, a second book and I get into it into a little more a little more detail in, in the second book. But it was very, very obvious um, by around August or so. We started really seeing some coincidences, if you would. Mm hmm. Um, and it got worse. It got worse. By the time, uh, let's say, October or so rolled around, we were using multiple 
LCs. We were doing false insertions. We were doing uh, false second insertions and going to a third LZ. Mm -hmm. um, the team um, during the briefings would only announce uh, formally uh, that went to Saigon. They were only announcing the first LZ or maybe even the first and the second. And um, we were all so convinced that there was, a, there was a mole in the system, somewhere in the system, because, you know, when you're, when you see Laos back at that time, I mean, it is a massive, massive, not wasteland, but just jungle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is just massive. Um, and how could they, how could they be there? At when, each LZ. Yeah. Shooting when you we, out at of each, each LZ. LZ. Yeah. 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 And um, but then it did um, it, it, they, they pretty much tipped their hand. The NBA government pretty much tipped their hand um, late in the year. I don't know if it was October, maybe maybe early November, somewhere around that time. They were calling out team members mm -hmm. across uh, Radio Hanoi and some of the, the broadcast station. They were calling out their names. They were calling out the team name. They were calling out the team name. We know you're being inserted. We know you were just inserted. They were calling out members. I know this uh, Don Bolkin told me how uh, they were calling out his name. They Don Bolkin, you're on the, you're on the mission. It's this team. I mean, it's it's pretty yeah, yeah. It's pretty clear. So, but where? But where was the leak? You know, when we were in Mylock. Um, I had an encounter with uh, a uh, Vietnamese um, black market vendor that set up shop at the end of uh, just outside the the uh, the fencing, the wire of uh, my lock. And in my mind, I was I was convinced that this guy was a spotter. You know, I don't know if he was or he wasn't. But it was around those times. It was he was an elderly man, but not old. Old. He was of military age, but you know, on on the older side of it. And um, I was just I couldn't understand why we were letting them set up their little black market stand right outside of a top secret launch site. <laughs> you know. So, but it, it was what it was. And uh, the teams were still able to to get in. I mean, the, the, um, the North, North Vietnamese were, were not stupid by any stretch. Um, they were starting to um, string uh, piano wire between trees in proposed LZs where there, it could be used as an LZ with nothing other than claymores um, pointed towards the uh, the center of the opening from the trees, um, you know, where a helicopter would activate it. Um, there were there was just too many too many occurrences where the NBA were waiting, um, and a lot of times they waited until the air assets left the area um, when they'd move in on the team, uh, which was which was another problem for sure. So can you talk about I know that, uh, you know, it was a, it was it was a rough time for the men. It was a rough time for the aircraft. You talk about losing a King B in Laos. Yes. Uh, uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, the King B pilots were phenomenal. They they were just incredibly skilled, incredibly, incredibly uh, brave, um, and they were used with um, SOG a lot, a lot. And on one occasion, we were um, supporting a hatchet force. I believe it was uh, Red Devil. Uh, hatchet force in Laos, um, not deep in Laos, but just just beyond the Asha Valley uh, into Laos. And um, in the talk, 
before we left on the mission. Uh, the, the flight strategy was laid out. There had been um, a lot of NBA movement in the area where we were going, where the hatchet force was. The hatchet force was up on a hill, uh, one part of the hill on, on the northeast side of the mountain. Um, there was like a overhang um, outcropping. And below that outcropping uh, was where the NBA were suspected to uh, be concentrating. And so we set out, uh, we, we set up our plan that the, um, we would, we would fly the King, there would be us. And then the King B would be flanked to our right on the fly out. And um, our wing ship would be uh, also flanked to the right, um, but um, not as far out as the King B. So the King B would be actually the furthest out. And our pilot made it very clear to the King B pilot that we're going to sweep, sweep around in a northerly, northwesterly manner and approach the uh, hatchet force uh, flying from west to east. And he needed to stay on our right side the entire time because we would keep ourselves um, um, between him and the NBA. Now, he was carrying a load of um, ammo, uh, explosives, um, food, water, and also carrying with him uh, was a guy by the call the uh, name of uh, um, Robertson, Sergeant Robertson. So we're getting out there. We're approaching the area. Um, on the ground, the radio uh, radio communicator said that uh, be advised. We still think there is an element, you know, located in that uh, that over overhang area. So we we told him we're gonna we're gonna approach from uh, from the west to the east, and uh, the King B will be on the east side of our flight. As we approached the area, for some unknown reason, uh, and very very out of character, the King B pilot broke formation and flew to the eastern side of us. So in other words, he put himself in direct line of this overhang. And just as he did, I mean, I can remember I mean, looking out and thinking, what the hell is he doing? And erupted a massive amount of ground fire, um, including an RPG that hit this, uh, this CH-34 and the thing just exploded and uh it went down the side of the mountain on fire um had a secondary explosion when it ended at the bottom and uh the everyone on board there were no survivors from that i mean it was nothing absolutely nothing left and um you know it bothered us as a, as the crew a lot that that happened because you know we're supposed to be protecting we're there to protect that that's our sole job we got one job to do and that's protect but again i mean he broke for again don't know why but he broke uh the pattern and flew directly where he should not have flown and we lost we lost that king b and uh um that Sergeant Hartley Robertson, who was um, in the news on and off through the 80s and 90s by imposters from Vietnam. Uh, you, you, you remember? You yeah, I, 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 even it's like, you know, maybe four years ago, there was a French guy That's claiming it, yeah. claiming to be a, the, a, a Mac V survivor from that aircraft. But just yeah. as you describe, I mean, there were people who saw that aircraft like go upside down, go into the jungle yeah. and explode. There's yeah. unfortunately there's 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 no way anyone survived that. Yeah, I know. And, and I I uh, um, responded several years ago 
as an eyewitness report on uh, no survivors from that from that crash. And um, it, it, there certainly there certainly wasn't. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible. Um, it was a horrible sight. So uh, yeah, we lost we lost a King Bee there, but uh, but that's not to discredit the King Bee pilots. They are phenomenal. They were they were absolutely fearless. Um, I, I would if if they would have any fault whatsoever is that they were very reactive, and um, and to me sometimes they might get a little tunnel vision where that's their target where they where they're going to go and they're going to get there. And sometimes it would break, break pattern to do so. And when when uh, the firefight would break out in the midst, they would lapse into Vietnamese, and <laughs> and we didn't know what the hell was going on or what they were saying. What one so. of my favorite stories? I think I think John Mayer told this story about how they were in a King Bee, and uh, w however they were coming down on the parking apron, there's a CH forty seven Chinook coming down, and so they're coming at each other. And everyone's like, hey, you might want to veer out of the way. And the pilot's like, this is South Vietnamese helicopter in South Vietnam. He gets out of the way. <laughs> and plays chicken with them until the 47 pulls off. That that would that sounds about right. They were they were a riot, I'm telling you. I mean, they were <laughs> they were they were a treat to fly with because they weren't gonna back away. There was no question about it. Um, you know, sometimes with the UE Slick, um, Sometimes the pilot would um, hesitate, let's say, and pull back, and we'd have to, you know, reset up and and go, you know, talk them down and what whatnot, and and go back in. Uh, but no, not the king bees. I mean, you 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 had to stay on your toes because uh, <laughs> they they might do things a little bit differently uh, to get the job done, and uh, we like to stick to a pattern. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I had a question. So let's go into when you got shot down. Because your book mm -hmm. starts off with with you and the harness. So can we talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, this would be the third time I got shot down. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> The second time was in was was in a bad area too. It was in the Asha Valley, um, right in the area that a few months later became known as Hamburger Hill. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that was the second time. the The third time I got shot down uh, was deep, deep in Laos. We had we had put a team in, and uh, on on September twenty second, we put a team in. They were supposed to be there to three days maximum. So they went in heavy on ammo, light on food. Well, it turns out the weather didn't cooperate. And to make a long story short, if I can, they were there seven days, exhausted, exhausted, um, hungry, um, and the weather finally broke. In the meantime, each day we're trying to break our way into Laos, but we couldn't. We couldn't get pat much past the border because of the weather that was so socked in, I and mean, we couldn't see anything. It was just you know cloud cover from, you know, six thousand feet all the way down to the ground. But when we finally, finally got a chance to get in and get them, um, we went out. It was on September twenty eighth. We left my lock. Um, we started taking a lot of anti-aircraft fire uh, just from the t right after we got into Laos, uh, heading past uh, um, Koh Rock Mountain, which is a uh, demarcation point, pretty much. Uh, Koh Rock Mountain, by the way, is where the NVA had their um, their um, artillery on tracks and was bombarded and kept Kaysan under siege. Uh, that was Koh Rock Mountain. So, but we flew by there all the time when we we're going into Laos. And um, right after we, we passed Koh, uh, Koh Rock, we started taking a lot of anti-aircraft fire, uh, a real lot. 
we got out to um, near where the team was and uh, we could see uh, the team had been discovered. They had been hidden for six and a half days. And while they were, and they were hunted for those six and a half days, they had been hunted down, um, but they were able to evade um, the trackers, the dogs, everything. Um, but they got, uh, they got discovered. One of the, um, one of the brew apparently when they were started making their way to the LZ, um, one of the brew coughed and that's all it took. And they were now in hot pursuit. So it turns out this area was a massive, um, grouping area for the NBA, massive, an area that held thousands. So the team makes its way to the pickup point to the LZ. And as we're um, making our way to the LZ, we could see, now we're probably a mile away at this point. We could see hundreds of NBA on a dead run um, headed in that direction. So um, I I started opening fire and taking down as many as I as many as I could. And my partner Scott on the other side was doing the same thing. Um, when we got to the LZ, the uh, small team was fighting off the NBA that were right there, right on them. They were just fighting them off. We lined up um, with the slick. The slick had um, was a new new pilot for SOC. And um, it was with the 101st Airborne uh, Aviation. <clears throat> but he wasn't accustomed to this, this type of uh, action. <clears throat> As we're coming in, we slowed our aircraft down um, to pace the deacceleration of the slick so that, you know, we're, we're staying right alongside of him, almost coming to a, to a hover as we're engaging the NBA that are um, starting to rip us apart. And, um, but we stayed on it. We, uh, we just kept pumping everything we had into the NBA. The last minute, the slick was uh, just a few feet off the LZ and he panicked and he pulled pitch and pulled away from the, uh, from the LZ. And now the team is, the team's just, it's there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we circled back and, um, you know, we were, we were shocked at, at what happened. Our pilot a fellow by the name of Jim Whitman, who was, um, you know, he was my pilot the whole time running SOG. He called across the, the radio and to the slick pilot. And he said, you know, he said, what the hell happened? And the pilot said, uh, I, I can't go in. So I'm going to get shot down if I go in. And um, Tim Schaff, who was the team leader on the ground, he came over the radio. He can hear what's going on. He came over the radio and said, if you don't get me out now, we're never coming out. And uh, which was a fact. So Jim Whitman keyed the radio again. He, he said to this, the slick pilot, he said, listen, if you don't go in and get that team, I'm going to shoot you down myself. And uh, and he, he said, listen, he said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do it like we did last time. We're going to put ourselves between you and most of the NBA fire. We're going to, you know, we're going to guide you, guide you in. Um, so he said, reluctantly, he, he said, okay. And uh, we set up our run. And uh, this time we got hammered so bad. We, we got hit so, so bad. And uh, at one point, 
it felt like we ran over a speed bump. And I found out later that in uh, one of the other slicks, uh, the SF Medic said it was a 37 millimeter round that came up and hit us, but it didn't explode. So wow. it must have been because, you know, probably high altitude settings for the for the uh, cannon or whatever. But it did throw some shrapnel around and a piece uh, went into the heel of the co-pilot uh, who was sitting in front of me. And um, we got ripped really, really bad. Um, I, it, it, we were shaken. Our helicopter was shaken so bad. And now uh, I could smell fuel. I could smell hydraulic fluid. Um, Covey came across and said, hey, we were going by the call sign of hair, like rabbit. And he said, hair lead, hair lead, you're on fire, you're on fire. So I leaned out and I looked back at the engine and sure enough, I mean, we're on fire. There are flames coming out of the cowling. And, um, but we're still with the slick. We're still staying alongside the slick and still putting down a lot of fire. Um, however, the slick called a mayday and crashed. Oh man. Uh, we followed, we followed the slick, uh, right up until the, the, the time it went in and, um, we were losing power the whole time. And, um, we, in front of the, where the slick came down about three or 400 yards in front of the slick. It was a big open field area and there were four NVA longhouses and it was like a regimental headquarters area or something, a main holding area, main NVA area. So when we, we saw that, um, our pilot said, let's dump everything we've got left into those longhouses. And we did. We've, we're firing the remainder of the 40 rockets. Uh, the 40 millimeter were pounding away just nonstop. And uh, Scott and I are just emptying our, our door guns into it just nonstop as we're losing altitude. So we're coming down, but we're still firing. We're still, we're still fighting this thing. And um, so the longhouses are exploding. We were hitting them dead on, and it looked it looked like ants coming out of an ant hill. So we were taking down dozens of uh, NVA, and um, we crashed uh, into a bamboo thicket. Um, I got knocked unconscious, and um, oh, be before. Before we crashed, I uh, I tried to call my partner Scott to see if he was okay, and our our intercom was shot out, and I I tapped him, and and mouthed to him, "Are you okay?" And he looked at me and he said, "Yeah." He said, "But he's going like this," and I said, "He's going." So I reached up, and here's a big gash oh, across across my flight helmet and i thought back oh yeah i remember i got my head got snapped back when we were the speed uh, bump <laughs> no not the speed bump it was separate from that oh really it was, <laughs> an, it was, it was it, a round it was a round a round had hit it i remember it's my head snapping back but you know in in the in the midst of everything that's going on i mean you're just you're just operating you know you're just you're just doing what you're doing so, uh, but then when we crashed, I got knocked out. Scott got thrown out of the helicopter a, sh a little bit. It, we, it, he had his monkey strap on, but it, it slipped some. I got knocked out. I got slammed against the uh, back of the co-pilot seat. And um, interesting enough, I, I got out of the helicopter and I'm hurting real bad and a little wobbly. And I looked down on the floor and here's my my watch. I had a Seiko watch laying on the floor. The, the band was snapped. It snapped off. And next to it was my St. Christopher medal. 
that I wore oh, wow. with no chain. I don't know where the chain was. So I just, I grabbed them both, you know, put them in my pocket, looked at the aircraft and I, I, I couldn't believe the condition. I mean, it was, I'd never seen anything shot up so bad. There was I, in the cargo area where Scott and I were, there was not a space any wider than maybe a foot that didn't have holes through it, through the ceiling, through the floor, through the back wall. And I, mean, I, I was thinking, how the hell could, how could that be? I mean, it should be full of holes here. Um, how, how can that be? And um, so we went into our, our SOP, which we had rehearsed. Um, in case of such an event, and that SOP was um, on the right side of the helicopter, just behind the cargo compartment was a small compartment that held a survival kit. <clears throat> Scott was, his job was to grab that survival kit. And my job was to uh, zero, out, zero out all the radios. Um, the pilot's job was to grab the maps and any any other intel that uh, printed intel that he had and grabbed that stuff um then he'd get he'd get out and i'd go around the front of the helicopter and open up the avionics and just shoot up all the avionics and the radios and all i tried to destroy as much as i could so we did that and in the meantime um we can hear the nva um uh, coming um so we started scott and i we had our m60s and we started just um uh, firing in the direction of uh where we could hear them charging and they had to be really pissed off of what's been going on you know uh we could hear the impact we knew we were finding finding targets because we'd hear the screams and whatnot uh, but they were firing at us high for some reason. I don't know. Maybe we're on a little elevated area um, the, the uh, where we crashed. And um, so now we're on the ground. The uh, the slick that was carrying the uh, that picked up the team. We had a another chase ship that was able to get them. Um, it not only got the um, the seven man team but it got the four crew members from the slick loaded on with the four crew members of the chase ship now they're heavily overloaded but they got out not a scratch on anybody <laughs> wow. Roger, they got do you, out. do you know if that slick that went down did it go down because of the gunfire or did it go down because yes. okay no. i didn't know if it went down it, because the pilot panicked or if it no 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 he he, he got shot down okay he was he was right he was going to get shot down but you know yeah, but you had to try, you know, right? But you had to try. Yeah. Well, it was there's no options, right? Yeah, you know, there are no options. Yeah, uh, you 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 don't just turn your back on your on your guys. So anyway, um, now we're on the ground. There's one more chase ship with a SF medic on board, and they're they're way up around seven thousand feet, planning on never getting into the action. Uh, it was also a new pilot, uh, a new first SOG. And um, I've actually had conversations with this guy in recent years. And he told me he was up there eating a banana, <laughs> figuring that he was not going to get involved with anything. <laughs> just, you know, he's just going to gain some experience of what's going on. And the next thing he knows, he's being called. Covey's telling him to get down there. And uh, so... Our our gunship wing ship uh, made one pass at the NVA that are trying to get to us and had to leave. I know they were running out of fuel because we were, you know, we were getting low. So he made one one pass. It slowed them down a little bit, and all of a sudden, when we're just kind of making a determination whether we make a run for it or we stand our ground, here's this uh, slick hovering above us, about 20 feet above. He can't land. There's no place for him to land. So um, he throws out um, four McGuire, McGuire rigs. Mm -hmm. 
Now, my partner and I, two weeks earlier, were um, practicing using these with one of the slicks that had them. We were we were flying around my lock, hanging you know hanging on these uh, Maguire rigs, just for the hell of it, and and just for the experience, what it was like, and have some fun and whatnot. These Maguire rigs were the very very first Maguire rigs. They were nothing more than a um, a thin half inch rope um, with a woven canvas woven loop in the bottom, um, like a child's swing uh, has the loop. Uh, you had to hold on to them, hold your hold yourself on, otherwise you'd invert and fall out. Um, but nonetheless, so they th threw the four ropes out. Right after that. Um, Sergeant Crawford, Dick Crawford, nicknamed the Fat Quack. He comes launching out of the helicopter uh, and he's on the ground with us. Now, for years, he always claimed that he got shot out out of the helicopter. Uh, you know, the, vibe, the helicopter moved and it threw him out. Um, he said, because nobody would a fool would go down there under those in that situation. Well, you know, I know better. He he's a, a hardcore medic. He didn't know what the situation was. He didn't know how much, you know, how much we were wounded, how badly anybody was. So anyway, now he's on the ground. We didn't need him, but it was nice that he came down. But the only problem is we've had four rigs and we have five guys. Now, Crawford, in my book, I was being very, very kind to him. And I said he weighed about 175 pounds. Well, Crawford didn't weigh 175 pounds since he left the eighth grade. He was, he, he was, he was a couple hundred pounds if he was anything. So anyway, um, we're on the ground. Uh, Scott and I are firing to the uh, NBA coming, trying to get to us. And we put on our... McGuire rigs and Crawford looks around and none for him. So he ties himself to me and um, Scott, my partner who had um, practiced wearing these, put, flying with these, he put it on backwards where the, instead of the rope here, he's got to do like this <laughs> to hold on. Now, Scott's favorite weapon, his personal weapon that he carried was an M79. Um, we got into rigs and I kept the M60 uh, with a length of uh, belted. And um, our co-pilot, who didn't know what the hell was going on, this was his first SOG mission, this Richard Chapman, his very first mission. And... Um, he thought the rope was too long. He didn't realize what the what the deal was. So he cut his rope. <laughs> and, and Crawford and Crawford yelled at him, What the hell are you doing? You better retie that. So he retied the he retied the rope. And, and now his rope is a little shorter. <laughs> but anyway, um we got into the we got into the rigs, the McGuire rigs. And um, the pilot under he's under a 12.7 millimeter is zeroed in on him and just nonstop shooting at him. And he wisely he turned his the helicopter so it was facing the um, the 12.7 to give us a smaller profile and um, some miracle he didn't get hit. And he kept his cool. Again, this was his first time. And <clears throat> as he's lifting us up, we got up about 60, 75 feet. We hadn't cleared the bamboo yet. <clears throat> and the NBA charged into, uh, into the clearing below us. Um, I, I, cut, I let go a burst from the M60, and I dropped three of them. Scott, others were starting to come in. Scott fired one round off the M79 and um, got the others that were coming in. 
and uh, it, it bought us enough time to clear the bamboo and to start our, our uh, long trip back, um, which was a whole other story, a whole other story in itself that um, that was one miracle after another after another on our, our trip back. So um, funny story, uh, years later, Crawford always would bitch to me that I'm the reason that he's deaf. <laughs> that he can't that he can't hear out of his right ear and i i would tell him you you, you ungrateful you ungrateful guy you i you give up your your hearing to save your life but uh that doesn't count <laughs> so um our, our trip back um is a whole chapter in in the book um which is Again, it's one it's one miracle after another, and and just just to, to tell you that um, while the pilot in the slick above us first came to a hover, his low fuel warning light and alarm went off, which meant he had twenty minutes of fuel. We had almost an hour to get back to uh, to anywhere safe. Um, into Vietnam, not even to Mylock, just to get across the border. Um, and his his uh, low flu low fuel warning light and alarms were going off, and we hadn't even got off the ground yet. Oh my God, that's and and while you guys are elevating so that you can clear the bamboo, like you're not just the helicopter, but you guys like there are anti aircraft rounds going off all around. Oh yeah. Oh, all around, all around. And they they followed us. Their communications up in that region were very, very good. And they followed us all the way until we crossed over into Vietnam, which was, you know, 45, 50 minutes. Later. They followed us. They would one would stop uh, for a few moments and then another one would pick us up. Now, the, the interesting thing is some of their anti-aircraft was radar controlled. Um, these guys were knocking down 105s. They were, they were knocking down fast movers. They were knocking down Jolly Green Giants. They've been knocking down Cobras, Cobra gunships, all kinds of UEs. Um, but they weren't getting us. And here we are just putting along like a snail um our our slick could only get about 55 60 miles an hour airspeed because of all the drag yeah and the elevation we were up 8000 feet um you know so yeah there's it was just one 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 miracle after another and and uh that was one one hell of a day do uh do we have questions for Roger uh we have first off uh Kim Kipling uh our friend Kim oh. yeah um, um uh, who wrote a great uh, a great book on uh, Dutch uh, Warenga? Warenga, yep, um, and was on the show. But he said Roger has an amazing degree of humility. Uh, this is a guy who repeatedly climbed out on the skid of a Huey, radically maneuvering in combat to clear jam miniguns. He is a genuine hero. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Um, and then we have. Uh, let me get there real quick. We had one question. Do we have anything from Patreon, D? Uh, I, yeah, no. Okay, uh, let's see here. From Michelle Ann, thank you very much for the very generous donation. Have a drink and toast the lost of our uh, recon team, Alabama, May 4th, 1968. My dad was the lone survivor and ultimately <laughs> spotted by a pilot after three days on the run. Oh my God. Thank you to all of those pilots. Mm. Yeah. Unreal. Yeah. Amazing. We have one question for Patreon. Norm asks, any tips for helicopter student pilots? Well. What was the question? Any tips Can for you, helicopter student pilots? It's a great air. You're a great air aircraft 
to fly. I mean, there's nothing like it. They they don't have a very good um, glide path, pass, but uh, <laughs> but they're they're terrific. Enjoy them. Uh, don't fly into NVA fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try to avoid that at all costs. <laughs> so, I mean, Roger, I know we only kind of like scratch the surface yeah. of, of your career and what's in the book. We really hope people will go out and pick Buy up Buy this book. book. You owe it to yourself. We Save Sog Souls. It's, it's a fantastic, you, you haven't read anything like it. And you can find it on Amazon right now. Um, and the, the link will be down in the description below as well. Uh, it, Roger, what's the what's the second book that you're working on now? Well, the second book is um, part of it, or at least the second half of the book, is going to be about missions that I was involved with um, from the air and the viewpoint of team members on the ground, what was happening to them at the same time. Um, and, and I've got a, a few good stories that, uh, have come to me and I've been uh, working on. So that's going to be, um, uh, that's the second half, <clears throat> excuse me, second half of the book. And I, I'm finding it to be very, very interesting because, um, for example, the mission that I just talked to you about where we came out on ropes in the new book. I have a chapter talking about what Tim Schaff and his team were going through on a day-to-day -day basis <clears throat> at the same time, mm -hmm. but I and we were going through in our attempts to try to get them. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, it culminates at the uh, major firefight at the end. But it's um, stories like that. I have uh, there's another chapter that's going to be in a book about a phenomenal um, mission, one uh, like no other. And I mentioned this mission in the first book about three POWs. Um, the new book, this chapter is going to be about what was going on at the ground um, after we dropped the team off and what they were doing, how they went about capturing these POWs, capturing three, taking three POWs out of North Vietnam. I mean, this is just absurd. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and what was happening with them, what they were going through, and then our communication with them and what we were doing on our end. So, um, but, but the first half of the book is about um, what inspired me to get into the military. Um, I talk about basic training, which was a little bit um, different to say the least. I had a, uh, I had a uh, quite psychotic uh, drill instructor. That, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to give too much away, but he ended up spending his career in, uh, in uh, military prison. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I go through, um, you know, a little bit about uh, Fort Rucker, you know, what we were doing there, and then uh, and jump school, which was v which was very entertaining. I loved jump school, and it was such an entertaining group of cadre. Uh, it, 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 they're just some, a couple of funny, funny stories, and unfortunately, one very sad um, uh, event that happened in jump school. So, it's uh, it's that it's it's leading up to. Um, Vietnam, my time with the 101st uh, in stateside, and then uh, other missions in in Vietnam, and and uh, um, I, I've I've been able to gather information from uh, some of the people that I flew with back in the day that I have not communicated with in 50 years. Wow. So, uh, and one of them um, was a career um, aviator and you know uh, officer. So there's some interesting things, and um, that's what the new that's what the new book. And I hope to get it by the end of the year. When 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 that book comes out, uh, please reach out to us, and and uh, we'd love to have you on yeah, another time yeah, to, to talk about it. We'll plug okay. it. Yeah, you bet. Anytime, anytime. I I I'd love to come back anytime. Yeah, you want. Be great. Roger. I, I'm just curious. You know, you know, the Hueys phased out for the Blackhawk, 
and then you know you you there are all kinds of weapons platforms now uh and now the blackhawks are getting phased out by the the bell valor um uh, mm -hmm. how how do you see like did you like i don't know if you followed them closely after you left did you like the new wep the new systems that were coming out did you did people talk speak favorably favorably about the blackhawk compared to the huey and what do you think of the bell what is it, v280 valor yeah, I, I'm. I'm really. Um, I, I'm. I don't know enough about the the uh, the new the new aircraft to speak intelligently about it. I have. Um, I have seen the um, the Blackhawks used by the 160th. Um, I was very very fortunate to visit with them uh, last May, and and they were just phenomenal to me. And um, the weapon systems are very, very, very unique. Um, so I don't know. It's just uh, I, I didn't I didn't like the Cobras. Not that they weren't good; they were excellent. Mm -hmm. But the crew chief wasn't on board, you know, um, and and that was a big part. And um, I've had Cobra pilots tell me that they really, really needed that door gun capacity which which was not available i mean with the, with a cobra you're straight into a target and that's it you don't have the side mm -hmm. so much the side coverage and you know rear coverage when you break um but you know and things evolve and and they they you know they usually evolve for the better i i like the uh the uh, little birds that uh mm -hmm that the uh, 160th have. I think those are a treat. I mean, those are, I would love to fly one of those. <laughs> well, Roger, thank you uh, for coming on the show tonight. And uh, we'll do it again when, when the next book comes out. We'd love to have you on again. Um, th thank you everyone for joining us uh, tonight. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back on Friday with Christopher Miller, who's the former Secretary of Defense. Uh, and uh, we're excited to talk to him as well. Um, tell them, Roger, I mean, again, thank you so much, man. You're welcome. Very, very welcome. I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, working with you guys, being here, and like I say, anytime, anytime. Yes, and you're not so far away, so if you ever come through the, the rotten apple, please let us know. <laughs> okay, you got a deal. <laughs> thank you, Roger. All right, guys. We'll, right. See, you guys. See, uh, we'll see all of you on Friday.